Um, this is the one that you like. With this like change of weather here in Florida, I got like I woke up like super congested. I feel like I can barely breathe. <laughs> so if you hear a lot of this in the podcast, <gasps> oh, no, don't say that. Don't do not, it. I'm just trying to breathe over here. Just just move <laughs> your head sideways. All right. Uh, let's see. Where are we? Where are we? Happy Monday, everybody. Is it Monday? It's Monday, right? It is it's Monday. Monday. Okay, good. I know. <laughs> we spent the whole weekend at an amazing event oh, yeah. with oh, so amazing good. entrepreneurs. That's a difficult word right there. Entrepreneurs. <laughs> <laughs> You've struggled that since is, episode one, yeah, man. That, that's one of, I feel like that's one of the words that will I will never be able to master, but I will be using forever. <laughs> Whatever. The point is that this weekend was so enjoyable sharing with those yeah. entrepreneurs. And just being at that event. What's up, everybody? Happy Monday. Welcome to Content is Profit Live Behind the Scenes Edition. Oh, wow. That was a, like a long title today. <laughs> How you doing, Fancy? Do you have a caffeine on? I'm good. I don't have quite enough caffeine on. I have. Or, just like or probably in? The, yeah, in. Yeah, I don't. On. The, the good amount? The, it, it's a good amount. I'm not going to lie. I probably could have used a little bit more, yeah. too. A little bit more. It never hurts. But I'm very excited. I saw you doing push-ups before the show. <laughs> yeah. Is that a secret? <laughs> Maybe. Just so, so you get the little, the, the the little buff in the, <laughs> on, on screen. All right. No, it actually, I actually heard it from like high performers. Like Instead of drinking mm. caffeine, just get the blood pumping and do like a go. little bit of exercise. We also have the trampoline over there, so we, can't, we have to make that happen. I know. But anyways, guys, we have incredible news, by the way. We cannot share those just yet. <laughs> Oh, cannot open, wait. Open loop. open loop. Tomorrow we have an incredible meeting. Cannot wait. I'm very anxious and excited. And then uh, we'll be able to share it. Maybe, yeah. maybe we'll do a live stream. Who knows? We'll share on Wednesday. We'll share on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we have another member. Oh, that's right. Of I know. The, of the family. Of the, the, new, new family. the new family. The new family. Oh, there we go. Hi, hi to our guests <laughs> digitally over there. Poof. All right. Sounds good. Um, I'm ready. You ready, Fonz? Let's do it. All right. Let me make sure I got the right <laughs> the, the right one. I got I to gotta zoom in. I'm, right. I'm, I'm blind at this point. All right, here we go. We've got some hey, I'm Luis. And I'm Luis. And you're listening to the Content is before. Profit podcast. Where we talk about entrepreneurship, mindset, and of course, how to turn your content into profit. That's right. But most importantly, where we are here to have fun with you, <laughs> baby. Let's go. That was not smooth enough. But it doesn't matter because you can go to contentsprofit.com and join the family. That is right. That's Good right. job. I saved I, it? Yeah, you saved it. You, you like, like I'm so, still so used with to, a little bit of sound. to swooping in there. But I don't <laughs> care because I care more about the topic that we're going to be talking about today. Tell me what it is. Ooh, today we're going to be talking all about leveraging frameworks to do content right. I, I gotta say, you wanna I, know definitely, what? I definitely leverage today's guest headline <laughs> on their website to build our own headline. So you, you wanna know when I, I read this title, uh, I, I, I peed a little of excitement. What? <laughs> I got so excited. You know what, what word was it? <laughs> what? Frameworks. Fra I know. I knew. Uh, we, I knew we've talked about this this morning. I knew uh, you were going to be very excited about the frameworks. I know. Um, I know. I, I'm going to assume the reference is because you are party training your kid right now. Absolutely. Every That's time he why. gets okay, excited, cool. there's an accident. So <laughs> <laughs> That's right. exactly what happened. Fancy, who's our sponsor today? Good question. Good sir. Today's sponsor is your own the base grows yes we sponsor our own podcast with content momentum and you might mm. be asking yourself what is content momentum well if you produce a long form piece of content just like this one that you're listening to or watching and you need a fractional content team so you can get daily consistent content guess what we are here to help you out so slide in the dms at this bros co on facebook on Instagram. That's right. If you're enjoying this show, make sure to follow it in your favorite podcasting platform because every Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturday, these episodes are dropping right on your phone with incredible value. Get momentum in your business and in your life. That is right. And if today's guests help you move one step forward and closer towards your goal, please don't forget to share this episode and, and leave a five-star review. We are I, I, back. I, I should just say, and subscribe. Jonathan, last follow, episode. Follow, follow. Oh, follow. Come there on, man. Uh, yeah, get it right. right. I get it right, I get it right. Okay, good. Is it drilled in there? <laughs> get it right, get it tight. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> we are back with another epic week. And today, we have one of the best up-and-coming growth marketers out there. She is a productivity machine. That is right. Today's guest has worked for some incredible companies like The Hustle and now HubSpot, while being location independent for six 
plus years and traveling to over 50 countries. And she did all that while also writing her first book, which made over $100,000 in its first year, building projects that got her number one on Product Hunt. And <laughs> if that's not enough, if that's not enough, guys, she is also starting a podcast and scale it to 20,000 downloads in six yeah. months. You can tell I'm the one that writes this intro. Oh, sorry. boy. <laughs> you can tell she knows content. <laughs> Please welcome Director of Marketing at HubSpot, co-host of the Shit You Don't Learn in School mm -hmm. podcast, the one and only, Steph Smith. <laughs> you guys are the best. Best intro yeah. I've ever had. Yeah, thank you. Mission accomplished. We can end the podcast now. Yes. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Steph, we're so excited to have you here. Uh, like I was, you know, telling you behind the scenes, I actually reached out to you a while back and I was like, man, she's awesome. You know, she's like behind the hustle and trends. I'm an avid consumer of trends. And yeah. I was like, she seems so amazing. Like she has so many insights and she really knows what she's doing. And that actually didn't go through, but everything happens for a reason. And today <laughs> is the right day to have you here on the show, Steph. So thank you so much for being here. It's a total honor. Thanks for having me. You guys got me all stoked for this episode. You guys, that, all that intro music is so fun. And yeah, I'm really <laughs> excited. We, we like to party with Venezuelans. So we're like, you know, if we're going to do this, I, you know, funny story, quick story. Like before, before we dive into yours, when we first started our, our podcasting adventure, we had this show called Bruising Bros. And uh, <laughs> this thing was like done at 10 p.m. at night, trying to debrief a challenge that we were doing at the time with beer. And uh, two DSLR cameras trying to find that perfection. And, you know, um, yeah, it did not come out, right? Lots of friction. Lots of friction. No music in the background. We're not having fun. It was all stressful. And then those episodes have not seen the light of day. So the day we decided to do this again, we're like, we're going to have fun and it's going to be us. And this is why the colors are there, because all the set that you see and the music. So thank you so much for acknowledging that. It's so important for a creator to create that environment. So I really, really appreciate. Where are the beers, though? You missed the beers. <laughs> <laughs> that is the right question to ask. There yes. we go. <laughs> we'll, we'll, part two. Part two. We'll ship you a six pack and then we'll over here and we can have that, that part two with some beer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, you know, before we, we, we go there, we would love, you know, not just for us, right? We know a little bit of who you are, of course, a little bit of your journey. But for those that don't know who Steph is, right? Who are you? Where did you come from, right? All this amazingness on frameworks, on content, what you build with the hustle and trends and now HubSpot, right? Like, where did it all come from? Yeah, so I'm Steph. For anyone listening, I'm from Canada. Originally, as you mentioned, I've been location independent mostly for the last six or so years. Now I'm mostly based in California, just while we sit through this pandemic. But uh, I never really know how to intro myself, partially because... I'm all over the place. So a lot of people yeah. have gone down one pretty linear path for many years. I started my career, I did chemical engineering in school, mm -hmm. and then I graduated. Mm -hmm. I went into business consulting. After that, I got hired as a growth marketer for a tech company. After that, I got hired as an analyst for trends. After that, mm -hmm. I was a product manager for trends. Oh, and there's the train that always comes every <laughs> podcast that I do. Um, and then now I work for HubSpot. We were acquired. And mm. after being trends, now I'm building a really exciting project, a creator program. And so, yeah, it's kind of all over the place. And then alongside all of that, I guess, more official stuff, I taught myself to code a couple years ago. I have my own podcast, like you guys mentioned, the shit you don't learn in school. I wrote a book, <laughs> created a course. And so, yeah, I never really know how to intro myself because it's quite frankly all over the place. Uh, that was, you did a perfect job. And I think that is, <laughs> honestly, I think it's the first time that somebody mentions that about like, I have such a difficult time because I feel you've done so many things. You haven't just like stayed in a lane and it's like, this is just me, this is my identity. You're actually figuring things out. Hey, let me try this. If I'm not 100% happy, let me move on to the next thing. I mean, I didn't know you you graduated with a chemical engineer degree, right? Uh, I, I think that's absolutely amazing, right? And then consultant, the way you've moved up, taught yourself how to code. My mind is blown right now. We're definitely going to go there in a little bit. But this is something I noticed that we've mentioned in a few episodes. I don't yeah. know if people remember this, but we have a theory, Steph. <laughs> we say, 
all the very successful people are from either Canada <laughs> yeah. or Boise, Idaho. <laughs> and you just proved that theory right. You are from Canada. Super successful. We're, we're trying to put our the, the chip in from Venezuela out there somewhere. <laughs> like, we're trying. We're doing our best. Yeah. St Steph, like, obviously... Um, you know, I identify a little bit with what you just shared about the different things, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, our identity until like 18, 19 was soccer. Like that's, that was our life playing soccer. That's the reason we're in the States that we got here. We got opportunity. That's our like previous life. When that ended, um, there was a, there was a shift of like, I guess, identity or to find a new identity or like, yeah, and we were lost for the longest time. And I think we're still in that journey of trying to find what is it, what drives you to find these opportunities and kind of pursue on like just I mean you you taught yourself how to code that's so impressive to me like I I I don't know if I'm ready to start like that journey right I should maybe who knows but like what drives you and what motivates you to 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 chase that and uh, and actually build something right because you build something for each of the things that you mentioned yeah I think to first touch on this idea of identity it's so important because i too have crafted various identities throughout my life whether it's a marketer or whether it's a woman in tech or whether it's a chemical engineer and you invest in that and the more you invest in that it, there are positives but there are also a lot of negatives with associating your identity so heavily into something because it's basically like a sunk cost if you think about it mm -hmm. right so if if people are familiar with sunk costs it's like okay i bought something and now I feel the need to use it all the time because I invested in this and I can't get my money back, even if it's not driving me any benefit. Well, the same thing happens with your identity, right? So if, if I say I'm a chemical engineer and I invested four years into my degree and I feel great about that, but I no longer want to go that route and it's no longer serving me, the sunk cost element would be like, well, I'm going to still go down that path anyway, right? I'm yeah. going to still trek up that mountain, even though I know I don't want to reach the top of that mountain. Um, and so the reason I'm mentioning this is it's really important to, as Paul Graham says, he's an essay on this, is to keep your identity small. Because in most cases, what your identity is basically doing is just driving you down these sunk costs, right? It's driving you to make decisions based on the past and not what you really want to do today or in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that has been like a foundational shift for me once I realized that, that if I keep my identity small, then it opens me up to all of these possibilities. I mean, you hear, hear people saying all the time, like, oh, I can't learn to code because I'm an artist or something like that. And it's like, no, 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 that's your identity talking. And you can learn to code just like everyone, you know, the, the millions of people who have learned to code before you. And so uh, yeah. when it comes to like creating these projects, I think that's what drives me is where I realize like, if all these other people can do it, like, why should I restrict myself in being able to do these things? If I recognize that like I'm just mm. as capable as these other people and I'm not putting myself into this like arbitrary box, then it's like, why not? Anytime like something gets me intellectually curious, then I think that's the reason I'm more willing to pursue it is because I haven't put myself in that box like many other people have. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely. I th this topic of identity has come up actually a few times in mm. the in the last few episodes that we've done. We had somebody, Katie Richardson, she's really big in identity and kind of like helping entrepreneurs navigate through that. And I actually recently did at the beginning of the year, a challenge on identity and something that really caught my attention that I never saw it this way is that, you know, your identity becomes your, your human nature. So anything that you decide to do that is outside of that identity creates resistance and friction and your identity works as a magnet to bring everything back down to to that place right to that flat line if you want to call it that way so like you mentioned if i see myself just as the artist right and i am telling myself okay i want to try to code it's going to be so difficult for me because inside my mind is just going to be saying why are you trying this when you should be, I don't know, drawing or doing X, Y, and C? Immediate friction is going to happen. And it's crazy. And I want, you know, the person listening right now to do this exercise. I think this is a, the easiest way I could have felt it. It was, I usually have friction to get up early and go and do exercise, right? Because I told myself, yeah, I like to work out, but I... I I don't do it in the morning, right? I don't identify there. But if you start telling yourself, oh, I love 
running in the morning and you actually visualize yourself like in the cold morning running with your <laughs> shoes and making it enjoyable you're gonna like visualize in that identity and you can kind of like feel it inside of your body like oh that'll be cool like i kind of like want to grab my shoes right now and go out there for for a run that so, would be rude with her so no don't, yeah don't i it. won't do that okay stuff. i won't do that okay but <laughs> you know i i think it's it's so key and it's such a it's a, a an awareness thing i feel like and I'm curious, when were you, you became aware of these things, right? When we, you became aware of, okay, I need to perceive myself differently and let go of that sunk cost, which I'm sure it wasn't easy. Yeah, I think it was through a couple of realizations, which weren't all intentional. But to give you one example, like I remember um, being in consulting and spending a year there and looking ahead at my trajectory, which was to become like a partner in five years or something like that at that firm. And I was like, okay, I know what it would take to get there. I'm not so much against this, but like what else is out there and why is no one else considering it? Why are all these like people sitting around me, like so willing to put in five years into something that I don't even know if they want. And I kind of certainly realize I don't want. Um, and basically what I did is I just like took the leap. I, I left and, and joined like a fully remote company, a tech company that had a way less certain path. And I've made a couple jumps like that in my life. And every time it's become easier because I've realized that when you make those jumps, um, you're like, you kind of realize that you have the power to create whatever like future you want. And yeah. that is so empowering once you realize that again, like if you read your identity and you're like, I can literally become whatever I want. Like I don't have to be a chemical engineer or a soccer player. I can do those things for a period of time and then e be equally amazing at something else. Yeah. Once you start like kind of like getting in those reps, similar to what you were saying about like becoming like uh, someone who works out in the morning, there's so many like identities I've told myself, like I'm not a morning person or <laughs> I'm not like I'm not that girl who's super fit. And every so often I kind of just like, I'm like, wait, like, why aren't I? Or like, why can't I be? Mm -hmm. um, there's like, yeah. it's like super tropey, but a lot of people look at life and they're like, uh, you know, like, why would I do that? Or I couldn't do that or something along those lines. And it's, I think the like very simple way that you can look at life that completely transforms your ability to like make some of these decisions is just like, why not me? A lot of people look at life like, why me? Like, what? Yeah, why would me. I be the one to win this award? Or why would I be the one to write like a best-selling book? Or why would I be the one to, you know, quit my job and travel the world? Like, why me? But you know, you can flip that to very simple phrasing, which would just be like, why not me? And if you start looking yeah. at the world that way, again, it's you know, it's so corny. But if you really look at the world that way, it completely changes your perspective and allows you to just be like, yeah, like, why not me? Like, why can't I be that person to like be the leader and make a decision that no one else is making? Yeah. I love it. I th This is so cool. Um, Cause we've, we've gone through that, right? Like it was so hard at the beginning and we're like, well, why not we do a live show three times a week, right? Like, mm -hmm. and it was like, people are like, oh, how are you gonna keep up with that, right? Well, 244 episodes later, here we are. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that created a ton of opportunities. So, um, I remember an, an interview that you did, I was listening earlier and, uh, when you were, I think it was in Bali maybe, and you, you, you were looking online and all these things like how to be a remote worker or how to be like freedom of space or whatever. And uh, there were all these paid things and you were like, well, you, you guys were kind of making fun of that. And you're like, the only thing that you needed to make that decision and just buy the plane ticket, right? Like that's yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, uh, and I, and I and with that, you know, I was listening, I was laughing because that's true. Like the second we decided to do this, right? Or the second that we decided to chase our business opportunities or whatever we're doing, right? It was the decision that that marked the start. Now, after you make that decision, I'm very curious. Do you have, because you've done many things very successfully, and I'm sure there's many more to come. Do you have a framework that you follow since you're so big on frameworks? Do you have a framework that you follow? Okay, I, this is the idea. This is the, the decision I made. And how are you going to tackle that decision? Or is it just like, as it comes, it's very organic. Like, how do you, how do you then do the first three steps? Yes. Yeah, so I think what's important is, yes, you have to have a plan. You can't just like, well, you can actually just stumble into it. You can just book a plane ticket. You can just like start a podcast and just start recording one day. But it's like, this isn't so much a framework, but defining what the hell success looks like to you is, is so key because if not, you know, I, I know it's again, very corny, but if you imagine each of these journeys is like a path of a mountain, if you don't even know like where you're trying to get up that mountain, like 
you're just going to wander around, you're going to stumble, you're going to go in the complete wrong direction. And so you do roughly need to know what you're trying to accomplish. Is it to make $5,000 a month so that you can live in Bali and get passive income? Is it that you want to hit X thousand downloads a month for your podcast because that unlocks certain ad dollars and X, Y, Z? Like, what are you really trying to accomplish? And then set like an ambitious deadline. That's what a lot of people miss as well is they're like, let me just like venture down this path. And eventually if I just keep going at it, it'll, it'll work. Like when I decided to go remote, I didn't just go and buy, buy a plane ticket. I was working in my consulting job. And I basically said like, what are the elements that I need? What, what would success look like to me? And for me at the time, it was, I would be fully remote, right? So fully location independent, but it also meant I would get paid X dollars. And it also meant I was taking on a job that I would feel proud of that I would, mm. I was not like sacrificing my like future career just to have like that freedom element. And so this is really simple, but if people are like looking to make one of these leaps, it's just to jot down, like, what are the like three to five things that I need for this to be a success where I, I'm looking back and I'm like, God, I'm so glad I made that decision. And then just ask yourself what it takes to hit those things and then make them happen. I know that's like, overly simplistic, but a lot of people will either just like, avoid yeah. thinking about it entirely and never make the leap yeah. or they'll take the leap. And then like a month out, they'll be like, Oh shoot. I like moved to Bali and it didn't work out because like, they just didn't think about what they were actually trying to achieve. Was it the freedom? Was it like passive income? Like what were they actually trying to change in their life yeah. instead of just like following someone else's decision? Yeah, absolutely. And you say it might be overly simplistic. Leonardo da Vinci said, simplicity <laughs> is the ultimate sophistication. And I totally believe that, right? Like the more we try to grow our own business, I realize how many times we try to complicate things instead of like, it's pretty simple. Like probably the things that move the needle forward are pretty simple and we're still trying to complicate them <laughs> incredibly. Yeah. It's the same with making these decisions, right? Something that I don't want people to miss is the fact that you decided to consciously take a look at, okay, what are the par parameters, right? And that, that's a tough word right there, right? But the, the parameters of why I, like, what would make this move a positive experience instead of focusing on like, oh, what if I buy the ticket and then I have this problem and this problem and this problem. And I think that's where naturally most people's minds go is to, the problems, right? And if we put it in the context of business or content creation, right? It's like, okay, I got to start a podcast. Oh, well, but I don't have the equipment. How am I going to edit this? How am I going to do that? Right? Instead of, well, what if I want to do a podcast? I want to make sure like my brother was saying that we have a good time doing it. That is fun. We remove the friction. So guess what? Let's just go live to make sure it goes out there. And let's aim to do at least 10 episodes consistently and then we can take the next decision whether we want to continue or not right and it's that way it's very simple as long as you know exactly what are those i don't know if call it boundaries that you want to have inside of you know your your next experience but i don't know people do tend to complicate this thing a lot yeah I, totally and there is a, do. yeah oh sorry so, go ahead no, I was just going to say, I think most things in life are really, really simple. They're not necessarily easy. So for example, like mm -hmm. for you guys to show up three times a week, like that's not easy, but it's really simple for people to lose weight. It's really, it's, it's, it's simple for them to figure out. Sorry, I might mix them up, but it's, it's simple. It's mm -hmm. not easy for them to show up. Right. So it's simple. If I, yeah. if you knew you had to lose 10 pounds in the next month, you know what you have to do. It's not necessarily easy to do it but yeah. you know what you have to do. And the same thing applies to life, to business, to marketing, like all of these things. It's actually really straightforward. All the information is there. You just yeah. need to be really clear about like what you said, your boundary conditions, what you're really trying to achieve. And then you fill in the rest and it's not always easy, but you know what you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, my brother knows what he needs to do to lose 10 pounds. We got to take the, or <laughs> the Orioles away from you. <laughs> man, it's, it's girl, not easy, it's but it's simple, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and when they're there with the milk, oh, so good. And also right now it's like girls, uh, get girls, uh, girls, girls cookie. cookie season too. So like I woke up to like three like boxes in the kitchen. I'm like, yeah, those for me. And uh, Katie's like, no. And she hit it. So yeah, anyways, uh, super, okay. Tangent, <laughs> tangent alert. Tangent alert. Um, the, the reason I asked that question, right, is because obviously we live in this world of content, right? And, uh, and you're like the expert. And uh, for, for us, 
was uh, was somewhat of a challenge to try to find the flow, right? The flow of creation, the flow of distribution. I know you're super big on on distribution, probably more than just the creation process, and uh, that we we found that out very early in in our process as well. But also trying to find first what feels right to you, kind of defining that success that you said, right? Okay, if I decide to publish consistently, what's su success to us? For us at first was like, can we be consistent with just Facebook Lives, just us, right? After that, it was like, okay, let's do the show. What does that look like for us? We didn't see our metrics. We barely see the metrics right now because the show is a very, it's a very strategic part of what we do as a business. Uh, we're starting now. We're like, okay, sweet. Let's learn more, right? Because we have the capacity. But it's like, okay, the success was just get it out there first. Now, we also have to have the flexibility to be like to adapt, right? What's what's the audience saying? What's the market saying? What's your what What are the topics that are there? So how do you... First, I, I want to kind of explore like your story on publishing, right? And then from there, what have you seen? Like, what, what, how was, how was publishing for you at first? What did it come easy? Uh, did you do it out of necessity? Uh, you were like, no, this is like, I, I really enjoy doing this. How was that? Yeah. So when I first started publishing on my own, it was through a blog. And, for a long time, actually years before that, I had been debating launching a blog, probably similar to many people out there who are like, should I start a podcast or a newsletter or a blog? And for years, I told myself like, no, 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 there's like enough blogs out there. Like how, how the hell are you going to differentiate or actually like be something in the sea of so many other things? And eventually I just simplified it. And probably similar to what you guys did with the podcast, I said, by the time I was actually launching a blog, it was just because I had something to say. I just had something to say. I had something I had conviction around, something that I was passionate about and something that I knew a lot about. And at that time it was mostly about remote work, but um, that's that's all it was. And I think that's actually really important because a lot of people, as we just talked about, overcomplicate things, but then they also try to gamify it in a way where they're like, look, let me do a bunch of like keyword research or let me go look up like what I think people will care about. And then it just comes off is really disingenuous, but also harder for them, right? You were kind of like alluding to like how difficult it is to show up every day. Yeah. If you're showing up every day to write or podcast about something that you just don't care about or that you're just like, yeah. you don't know very much about, it's really, really hard. And it actually brings me back to something I talk a lot about because people come to me now and they're like, oh, but you're a writer, right? And I'm like, well, I don't know if I'd consider myself a writer, but I can tell you that in grade 12 English class, I wanted to kill myself because I found writing the most difficult thing in the world. And I think it's important to remind yourself, like, why did English class suck so much? And it was because yeah. you're writing about things that you don't care about, right? So you're given topics. You're asked to write about them in very, very rigid ways, right? Like, right, you're like three paragraph essay, right? And you're graded it on it in a way that is also unnatural, right? Where you're like, okay, let me turn this around in a short period of time. And it has to meet, meet all of these like very specific metrics um, or ways of evaluation. And so yeah. remember how bad that felt. And then keep that in mind when you're debating if you want to go create content online. So it's like, try to get rid of all of that friction, right? So only talk about things that you know a lot about because it's going to be easier. It's going to be fun. It's going to be painless do it in ways that feel natural because as a reminder if we take ourselves out of that english class we all content is is us communicating communicating one idea from our brain into many brains and there's many ways you can do that right and so get rid of this notion of like i have to write my newsletter in this way or i see everyone podcasting in this way so i must do it like there's way too many interview style podcasts we talked about this actually before we went live so get yeah. rid of the notion that you need to do it in some sort of way and also I do think there's, you know, there is an argument for being really consistent at the beginning, but don't hold yourself to unrealistic standards, right? Like if you can only show up once a week or once every other week, but that's what yeah. it takes for you to create great content that you're like excited about, then do that. And so to get back to your question, that's, that's kind of like how I reworked my system because for years I was like, no way I'm writing. Like I'm, this, this is not something I want to do. And then finally I just came to a point where there was like topics that I was excited to talk about. And I just did it as if it, I was just like telling a friend, right? Like just blurting out all the things that I wanted to say yeah. on paper, but on a screen in this case. And that actually worked incredibly well. My blog grew way quicker than I've seen most blogs grow because mm -hmm. whatever I was saying, I was knowledgeable about and seemed to resonate because it came from a place where, again, there was like no motive behind it other than having a, a concrete 
points of view. And that kind of just to like wrap yeah. this up, I think that's what a lot of people get wrong with content is they think they need to be like the most deeply researched or like the the expert of the experts in order to talk about something. But most of the time when people read content, they're actually looking for you to not necessarily be the most you know, knowledgeable about the thing, but to do it in an in interesting way. So some people like you guys are like, and there's the train again, are like <laughs> way funnier, right? Like you guys are like, like personable and like, I, you're like, I want to be around these guys. Other people like James Clear are just very concise, right? And mm -hmm. so some other people appreciate that. The same way that you appreciate the branding or the way that physical products are sold, the branding or the way that content is produced is equally important and that's what a lot of people get wrong and so i know i kind of just like went in a bunch of directions but that is like so key is that when i figured out that when i wanted to write i was doing it in my own way mm -hmm. and i was doing it in a way where i could have that differentiator because it was really just like it was coming from me then that like was a game changer and and that's i think why my blog ended up being a lot more successful than most blogs that have a lot more yeah. like forethought when they're going live <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think what you're talking about it goes even beyond the, you know, the cliche advice you could say that of finding your voice, right? A lot of people say, mm -hmm. oh, you got to find your own voice. And I, I think, yes, that totally, you know, has a point in this side of the conversation. But, uh, but at the same time, I feel like you're going beyond that, beyond just finding your own voice mm -hmm. is what is the stand that I can take in regards to a topic, right? Because when people are reading something at the same time, they're evaluating with all their previous knowledge, whether they agree or disagree, or if it's just blah, right? And I feel like more, most content falls in the category of being blah, right? And then yes. people don't have <laughs> any sorts of emotions toward it or don't want to share it. They're like, okay, next, let me look for the next piece of content. And first, I, I want to clarify, you don't need to be like a total crazy persona to resonate with somebody or to have a, a, a point of view, a clear point of view um, that makes a stand, right? I mean, Steph, right? I feel like your voice, how you present yourself is super clear, very data driven. I feel like I, I, I want to dig into the whole analysis and, and how you do research and all that stuff. But, I, and I think that attracts people's like, she is a well-educated person that knows what she's talking about. Yeah. And you give this sense of, um, this is going to make no sense, but it's like online confidence. Like when I read your <laughs> stuff, I'm like, she knows what she's talking about. Like this has to be true, right? And some other people you can tell like, oh, they are, it's, they're just making this thing up completely. For example, I think like our edge, like you mentioned, right? Like we try to make this fun and our personality. And we actually had a previous mentor that again, we love him. We don't have anything against him. But when we ask him, who should who should be the face of our content, right? Just one of us, like the this two of us. This was before we started the podcast. The, the podcast, yeah. yeah. And he was like, because of what he knew at the moment, he was like, I think there should be only one attractive character. And we were like, oof, man, like that's rough. At the, at the, we look at each other <laughs> and we're like, okay, sure. Like we're going to do that. And then as we started debating the idea of publishing the podcast, we realized like, mm. whatever, let's go, let's, let's both go at it. We both have different opinions. Sometimes, you know, we're getting discussions, we get, you know, a little bit of banter here and there. And at the end of the day, now when people come into the show, just like you did earlier, you told us like, I love the mechanics that you two have going on. Right. I think is it's, it's a lot of fun. And that yeah. turned out being like one of our <clears throat> edge points yeah. when, publishing this podcast yeah it's become it's become an asset right so now like sometimes i don't think we've ever done an interview it's just one of us like it's uh, and you know maybe for yeah. some people like uh looking looking ahead would that be uh an asset or w would it become hard to sustain we don't know but at the at the moment right today we're really enjoying it and we're just making yeah. sure that we, that it's out there we actually leverage the whole thing with a competition we start a competition <laughs> called hashtag pk bro so Steph, <laughs> be prepared at the at the end of the podcast we're gonna we're gonna throw you under the bus you're gonna be like oh, which boy. one is the best bro um, <laughs> yeah. that's so funny i was Steph, gonna what, say 
just quickly, like, I think that's one thing to keep in mind is like, I know we love getting feedback or, or advice from a lot of people, but like, I bet that mentor of yours, like had never grown a podcast or maybe he had, but like, it's, it's important to remember that if you're getting advice from anyone, like have they actually built the thing that you're looking to build? And even with podcasts, like something to keep in mind is a lot of the podcasts at the top of the charts are at the top of the charts, not because they're the best, but it's because they had external audiences to grow mm -hmm. a podcast because podcast mm -hmm. growth is so difficult to do. Just like go yeah. down the line of all of the top podcasts out there. They're all either part of a large network or they as an individual had a large network. And so I think we're seeing that change over time as like more people launch podcasts and like uh, there, there's better growth mechanisms. But just keep that in mind that like I think a lot of yes. people especially if they haven't done it themselves, would look at the top charts and be like, oh, you have to do like an interview style individual podcast about business to hit the top of the charts. And it's like, no, 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 that's not it. They're not at the top of the charts because that's the best format necessarily. But that's just the only those are the ones that have been around the longest and that had those yeah. external networks. Interesting. Thank you for bringing that up. I think like that's like the the elephant in the room in so <laughs> so many of these conversations that people are not willing to talk about, right? That we we we'd never done a promotion like that, for example, like for our own show, because again, the objective was to be consistent and to connect and build the relationships. We've been part of, we've seen some of these campaigns, right? And it's like, it's it's crazy to see like, okay, in the, in the next period, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, totally like awesome boss move, like marketing move. I, we, I, I've been frontline on the daily, the daily hustle uh, show launch, right? For example, I feel like what you guys are doing there is incredible. And every marketer, every person trying to like do something that should go and, and see what you guys are doing because it's, it's awesome. It's leverage. It's like, okay, how can we, at the end of the day, your message you want, if you really believe of what you, in what you're talking about in, in, in what you're sharing with the world, more people should listen. Right? So, okay. If that's really the objective, how can now we leverage whatever, network, connections, people, friends, family, to make sure that as many people as we want listen to it. So totally okay with it. It's just sometimes from the outside, like you said, people observe that and that could be a big element for them not to publish. And we don't want that to happen. We want you to, to publish, to put your message out there. Yeah. Um, so uh, now that we're like diving a little bit into podcasts, you have your own podcast, right? She didn't... What, what, what's up? I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> no, you're good. It's it's kind of a long name. Shit you don't learn in school. Shit you don't learn in school. I knew it had <laughs> the word shit and the word school in it. You're sure was, saying that. You're, you're shit school. Life, we'll just call yeah. it shit school. Shit school, shit school. <laughs> right? And I, first of all, I absolutely love the name. But you have some good growth, right? 20K downloads in six months. So let's talk about that growth for you and your show, did you leverage the network that you built through, you know, launching your book or the book came after that or the network that you build, uh, you know, writing the blog? How was that process for you in launching your podcast? Yeah. So as I mentioned, podcast growth is notoriously hard and that's for several reasons. You guys have probably run into all of these reasons, but like one, the analytics are terrible. Right. Like if you look at just a comparison of the analytics in a podcast platform versus something like YouTube, it's just like ridiculous, the difference. <laughs> and then in addition to that, the like traditional ways that you discover content, just like compare written content versus audio content, written content. Where do you find things? Well, you can search for them. Someone can email you something. You can be on something like Reddit or Hacker News. There is like so many different like forms of discovery that you get with uh, written content. Think of the yeah. way people discover pods. It's like you hear about it on another pod or your friend tells you about it. Of course, yeah. someone could say, yeah, like you could search for it on Apple Podcasts. No one does that, right? And so the main yeah. ways that people discover podcasts are really, really limited too. And so for those reasons, and I'm probably missing some others, it's so hard to grow a podcast, which is again, why all of the podcasts that are at the top of the charts have these like networks that they're, they're, basically able to get their growth from. So Absolutely. understanding this, I was like, shit, well, how are we going to grow this pod? It's going to be hard, um, especially mm -hmm. because another growth mechanism that a lot of people deploy is guests, right? So you bring a guest yep. on, they promote it. Our podcast doesn't have guests. It's me and my co-host talking back and forth about an idea. And so we have, it's been hard, but I guess a couple things to, to call out. 
One of them is that a lot of the time when people share their podcast, they're sharing the entire episode. Think of the like friction it takes for someone to like see something and be like, I'm going to buy into this whole episode. And so that's why you've seen the like rise of all these audiograms. We use Descript, but lots of other tools like Headliner or Air, A-I-R-R. Um, I all of those one. tools. Yeah, I'm not affiliated with any of them, but those tools allow you to take snippets of them, post them on places like Twitter, which actually yeah. which enhance your ability to almost like bite size, like to, to show people a part of something mm -hmm. and make them interested. One little yeah. quick tip on that is if you do add if you do post those on Twitter I've been like speeding mine up by somewhere between 30 to 50 percent because people get bored on Twitter so quickly and so if you have it yeah. at that 1x slow speed people mm. are bored they're scrolling by and so that's worked really yeah. really well Wow. another quick tip on Twitter is which is where my audience is so I would say like people should apply this to of course wherever they have an audience but on Twitter specifically Twitter hates external links and so what I've been doing is like, is tweeting about something related to the podcast topic we're talking about, not mm -hmm. including the podcast link. It's not a promotional thing, but then once it blows up, if it blows up, then, you know, you've seen lots of people do this, I'm sure then adding, like, if you like this tweet, then, you know, you'll love this episode. Okay. So an example of this is I tweeted this thing about the 40 hour work week um, that totally blew up. I think it, you know, got over 10,000 likes on Twitter. And then I added that the the like appendage that brought in like thousands of downloads to that episode because wow. people it was like directly related but didn't feel overly promotional and also twitter didn't discount the original post because it had a link in it yeah so those are a couple things to do another really unrelated one that i'll just i'll stop after this one is just anytime you see someone tweet keep, saying, keep, keep spilling the secrets okay <laughs> we, again we don't have to go anywhere we can just be here <laughs> Uh, one of one of the other underrated ones, which is is not going to move the needle for you, but it will help you get traction early on, is just all the time. If you if you're seeing people um, tweet about your podcast or even mention it or comment on it, DM them or email them or whatever platform you're on, and just be like, hey, like saw that you you talked about this thing. Any chance you could subscribe, leave a review, send it to a friend. Anytime I've done that one on one, people are like, oh yeah, of course, and that's you know, led us yes. to like our first 50 reviews or whatever. And so yes. those are a couple of things that have helped us. And then I would just, you know, say that ultimately the best way to grow a podcast, unfortunately, still is being on other podcasts. So I was on My First Million. That really helped us. I think I'm joining Indie Hackers sometime next week. And so that's hopefully yeah. going to help. But like that's it, it's unfortunate that there's not more dependable ways to grow a podcast other than using your existing networks. By the way, you just did like the the, the quick guide to uh, podcasting growth. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll co-build well, that and you know. Quick question: <laughs> I, I know the last chapter of your book is about growing podcasts. Are these tips in there? Can people go find them yeah. in your book? Yeah, yeah. So I I actually had like a mini chapter, like a bunch of like four different videos and slides that I created a year ago, but that was actually before I had built my own. So I'd worked on other podcasts and like helped my first million and stuff. And so there's actually like an upgrade coming to that, which is based on actually doing it myself and yes. going from zero to 20K. Oh. So, so yeah, that's probably going to go out in the next couple of weeks. And so, yeah, if people are interested and they're like, I want to get everything you just talked about, but way more about podcast growth, they can find it at doingcontentright.com. Yes, yeah, so awesome. we're going to leave the links right below. All you got to do is scroll down and click in there. Yeah. Now, I, Fonzie, I know that you're dying to ask something. <laughs> I'm like but itching stop. to ask questions. Right? <laughs> Hold on. I have one that came up as soon as you said, podcasting is so hard to grow right so how do people justify podcasting right because like for i, I have an answer for us like that that's coming from us but we were at this event this weekend with 12 ceos right and the the one part of the event is and we're probably the most underqualified yeah. in that room it's like a brainstorming session brainstorming where session. somebody stands in the middle of the room they share one of their problems and then everybody starts, yeah. you know, helping them solve that. And, issue. and here's the background on the group. There are people that they had a $7 million a year uh, event company, the other one, 14 million. The other guy invested this 1 million in, in a machine that didn't work. And, they, and he was like, oh yeah, we just invested 1 million. So it's people that have been in the game for a while and they have resources, right? So one of the people that jumped on there to ask questions, they their main product has to do with content. And one of those pieces is podcasting one of the, the the feedback that came back to them was 
How do I measure this? What's the ROI? It's so hard, right? Like so, and and everybody that podcasts for some reason, we're massive fans of this platform and we continue to do it consistently over time, right? So how do how do we justify podcasting, right? Like uh, we have our way to explain it in the business way, but I'm very curious your point of I'm view. Just, I'm, just, your work. I'm just going to say when you said ROI, Steph had like a, a little smile in there. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure. Anyone, <laughs> ROI, data, comment. spreadsheets. Automatic, yeah. like dopamine, dopamine receptors firing. <laughs> no. uh, it's a great question. And I actually think a question that's not asked enough, this, this like, why should I podcast? And it's actually mm. the question that um, I don't see enough people asking about content in general. So we all know like content is so powerful, creator economy, all these like flagship terms that are being thrown around. And it is true that content is probably more exciting than ever. But then you also see these CEOs or random people who basically mm -hmm. just like feel the need to create content because it's time to do so. Right? Like you know, a CEO will be like, well, sounds like we should have a blog or sounds like mm -hmm. we should have a podcast. And that is like yeah. the worst thing because any CEO that says that is not going to be putting the right investment or understand what they're really trying to achieve with content. Because yeah. remember, content has many different forms of ROI even, right? So it's like, are you trying to make dollars off of advertising? Are you trying to grow your brand awareness so that you're reaching millions of people, but not actually directly monetizing it? Are you trying to create this so that instead of advertising other companies through ad dollars, you're actually advertising your own business and, you know, getting ROI that way. Like there's so many ways that you can yes. drive ROI through content. And unless you know what you're actually trying to achieve, whenever I hear a CEO or someone of the like be like, it's time to start a blog. I'm like, for what? Like just because mm -hmm. your competitor mm -hmm. has one or because someone else has one. And so I am all for content, but it is important to know what you're trying to achieve. And then within content, as you're mentioning, the ROI that can be driven through a podcast is much different than a newsletter, which is much different than a blog, et cetera. And so mm. podcasts, because of their lack of attribution, are likely one of the worst content paths that most companies can invest in. Just being straight up. Like, yeah, 100%. If, you, if you're looking to build a lot of strong relationships with your listeners, and strong is an important word there, do podcasting. But for example, if you're looking to reach mass audiences, like real mass audience, podcasting is one of the hardest mediums to grow. And so you're much better off launching a YouTube channel, building a newsletter, creating a blog, if you're just trying to reach as many people as possible. Similarly, wow. podcasts are really, really hard to make um, a lot of money off of in terms of advertising. And so if that's your goal, podcasting, again, is like much less lucrative than a newsletter or some of the other forms of, of content. And so the place that I see podcasts fitting, which they obviously has a, have a place and I have one of my own, is just th to think about it like this. Different forms of content people engage with differently. So how many newsletters do you guys read in a given year, let's say? And I'm not mean like how many different ones hit your inbox? Ponzi, like yeah. 300, uh, <laughs> me, like three. Yeah. Okay. I, I've tried to limit it. I, I've tried to limit it uh, at five at a time. Yeah. So if there's a six one come in, one yeah. of those previous five, to, yeah. uh, they have to go. That's great. That's great. So you guys are probably much better than the average person. I'm sure you guys have seen this, but most people think of the number of newsletters they have hitting their inbox. It's probably like a dozen plus, right, uh, of ones that they read at some point. They're not going to read every article or every send from that person, but they're going to they're going to see quite a few, but not hundreds. Blogs, on the other hand, are even more on the like less strong relationship, but but larger network. Where in a given year, you don't even realize it, but you're reading articles from hundreds of blogs throughout the year. Whether it's you know a, a large media company like The Verge or some niche blogger, you're reading tons and tons of articles from these people but you don't know like you're not checking who this reporter is or you don't feel like you have a direct relationship with this like yeah. blogger who wrote this article that your friend sent to you right podcasts mm -hmm. are on the other end of that spectrum so you imagine blogs are the the least relationship driven but you can mm -hmm. reach the most people newsletters fit somewhere in the middle where you maybe you do recognize the people but you're 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 allocating a fraction of your attention to quite a few different people yeah. podcasts on average people listen to six podcasts total total right and so yeah. the podcast that you listen to 
you are much more dedicated to. In fact, I'm sure you guys have heard this when you have podcast listeners, like they feel like they know you. And it makes sense mm -hmm. because when you read yeah. a blog article, you're spending what, three minutes. When you're reading a newsletter, you're spending maybe five to 10 minutes. And when you're listening to a podcast, you're spending an hour with that person most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. And that's every week, right? So it makes sense that it's, it's a totally different dynamic. And so where podcasts play a role is really cementing relationships with your audience, right? Yeah. It's 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 a much different mechanism. And so that definitely has value, right? And that's, I've had people ask me, you know, of all the things you could create a TikTok, you could create a YouTube channel, you create a podcast, why did you choose a podcast? And it was because for me right now in my like personal brand, I'm trying to build up my brand in a way that I have really, really strong relationships with the people who yes. are following me, who would buy my products in the future, who would want to like, you know, meet me at a conference, who I could become friends with. That's what I'm looking for. But a lot of brands aren't looking for that. And so that comes back to your question of like, is it the right move? And my answer is in most cases, it's actually not the right move for especially a lot of, of businesses. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I, I'm going to add a little bit of our point of view and I'm going to, you know, salt bay with salt bay. podcasting <laughs> over here. And... <laughs> You, you mentioned that trust and kind of like the depth in the relationship with the audience. What we experience on our, on our end, right? Because let's be honest, we don't have a massive audience, right? We do have some people that come in and they, they reach out to us and they're like, oh, this conversation was awesome. And it's, it feels amazing, right? Don't get me wrong. But for us, the main leverage point, let's go that way for us, has been, again, based in trust and relationship but with the guests that we're bringing on into the podcast, right? Those relationships have literally changed our life and our business. Like we've met people that we would have never thought about meeting or we never thought about them giving us an opportunity of having a conversation with them for an hour on a one-to-one -one basis. And then that creates an opportunity to follow up and even build that relationship in a deeper way. I mean, 90% of our business has, has come through the guests that come to the podcast, right? So we put that focus so much on, okay, let's build our own community based on the guests that we're bringing on. And that can either lead to uh, clients, partnerships, opportunities, right? You never know. And it's absolutely amazing. So I love what you're saying. And I love the honesty and the transparency on being like, hey, look, it might not be the the best. It actually, you know, probably recommended not yeah. being the strategy for most businesses. But let's say what we found is if you're a business that have a extremely high ticket program, right? Something that you can, you're probably in the ABM side, account-based marketing side of things where you're targeting specific accounts, right? Specific type of businesses to work with. Podcasting is a great medium to build those relationships yeah. as well because as soon as you bring them on and you spend an hour talking to them you're going to build that rapport that trust and then just following up on those conversations is going to be so much easier because now you get direct contact with the person that you're trying to talk yeah steph so just a little background too like where maybe in the world that you move i'm not to totally assuming and correct me if i'm wrong right like there there's a lot of investment there's some capital available to explore different possibilities right maybe not with you you but like maybe no, I listened to my first million, right? And and uh, and the way that that's that one, they that's one of our six podcasts in the that's one of the <laughs> podcasts, absolutely like that has to be in everybody's rotation. Um, but and and when we started, we did not have access to capital, right? We have to like go out and sell, like the the service, for example, right? So for us, it was really challenging to first decide what platform to go on. Uh, and then how can we stay consistent, right? So for us, that's why podcasting means so much because it was the fastest path to that person that we could develop a relationship with and see what the opportunities come, but also is a great platform to leverage mm -hmm. the micro assets, for example, you know, the tweets that you're talking about, the micro content that we create for us and for, for the people we work with, right? Those things have helped a ton because it creates a safety net of content that when people listen, hey, I met the business or I saw the business somewhere, they're going to go to those accounts and they're going to see like, oh, they've been publishing for a long time. Maybe they don't consume every single piece of content like we mentioned earlier, but they're going to be like, oh, I'm built. Uh, I see that they're being consistent. They're showing up for this amount of time, and that helps also build that rapport. So that's where we're coming from as well, and that helps a ton. So, what would your advice be for 
and maybe you were in this position, right? Uh, for people that are starting to transition into, you know, they have the day job, they want to transition to building their own thing. They want to create that consistency in their content. Uh, what will be like maybe one or two action points that they can, they can take there? Yeah. So I think what's really important here, and, and you guys isolated this for yourself really clearly, is for people to understand what they're trying to achieve. And just to give a couple examples, because people are like, oh, that's such a simple question. There's only like two answers to that. Well, it's like, if you're starting a podcast, are you looking to convey a new idea, to build your personal brand, to be seen yeah. as an expert, to be connected with other experts, like you guys are saying, to drive funnels or drive top of the funnel traffic to other products, to increase direct MRR, to grow your professional network, to teach a particular skill, to just have fun, right? Those are just like, I'm, there are many more examples, but it's like, what the hell are you trying to achieve with yeah. your content? And trust me, if you were to basically like write this down, write down all the things I just said or any that I missed, and then write down the different forms of content. If, you, if you've discern, discerned that you want to create content, write down blog, newsletter, podcast, et cetera. And then TikTok, you know, whatever, you, whatever you're considering and highlight the one that you that is your North Star, what are you really trying to achieve? And that will automatically remove some of them if you're really think of, thinking about this critically. And you'll basically be able to like see which platforms, like rate them like one to 10 in each of the categories and then figure out which categories are most important to you, right? This is like a classic ice matrix, but you don't even need to be as analytical about this, but really just highlight what is your main thing that you're trying to achieve. And to yeah. your point, like if, if your goal for you too was to build this professional network or build this network of, of other really cool people that you can work together with. That's like impossible to do with a blog, right? Like you're never going to do that with a blog or it would take years to do with a blog. Um, and so you're not going to do a blog. Can you really do that with a TikTok channel? Not really. So you're, you're, you know, you're starting to eliminate the ones that don't facilitate your true goal. And I think even though this is a similar or a simple exercise, People don't go with this exercise at all most of the time. They're just like, well, I saw my friend start a newsletter, so it's time to start a newsletter. Or I saw yeah. the Biz Bros and they have a podcast, so I should probably start a podcast. And so yeah. that is what I would, that's like the, the step I would encourage people to take if they're considering doing any content. And then, yeah, double down on the channel that you choose because the other thing to keep in mind is we've all done this, but if you split your attention across five channels, you're not going to make any progress across any of them. And so I think it was really smart for you guys to realize podcasting is the channel we want to focus on. And then you've gone all in, you do three episodes a week. That's, that's amazing. And so that's what I would encourage. I'd encourage people to follow that similar playbook. Thank you. I, I, this takes me back to part of the beginning of the conversation where we said it's simple, but it's not easy, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what you're saying. Put it all on paper, right? Try to define it. And it goes back to making that decision to go in yeah. Bali, right? Put it all on paper. What is it that you want? What is it that you're trying to accomplish? Well, what fits in there, right? And where is, where is it that I'm going to go? And then yeah. just make the committed, uh, make, make a committed, no, make, wow. Make a committed decision or make a committed make a decision. Commit yeah. Wow, good job. That was, that was a tough one, yeah. I need, that. I need to stay better hydrated Steph, while we do this I've, been, I've been trying to convince <laughs> Fonzie to, to go dance on TikTok. Uh, he doesn't listen. So, you know <laughs> I was trying to hoping. I was like putting you on private message him, like tell him to. No, I'm kidding. After we, after we done the, the podcasting world, we'll, we'll go. Down I think you, TikTok. I think you guys would do well on TikTok. Just, just oh, boy. we have a conversation tomorrow. But that might come up. <laughs> we, we we have two videos that we posted on TikTok. It was actually a pretty funny one. They were hilarious. Uh, my wife didn't think it was hilarious. She was like, "What are you guys doing with your life?" Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Step. All right, we, we're, we're getting close to the end, but I've had this question, honestly, since I started reading The Hustle and I knew you were involved. And then when I saw you were super involved, obviously, with trends, I was like, I've been wanting to ask Steph this question. So it has nothing to do with podcasting. It's going to be like a 180 over here. But <laughs> I'm so curious on how do you do your research? Because you guys, <laughs> and I know you have a team, you guys work with a lot of people, but I'm so amazed by the things that you find out and it's like how? how how do you come across this information like where do you even start so a lot of people ask this and i was on my first million in december and that was like the number one question people are <laughs> like can you create a course around this and 
I might at some point, but yes, I think please. people would be candidly a little disappointed that it's not this like crazy <laughs> workflow where we have like machines like finding stuff for us or anything. Like, <laughs> I think one of the amazing parts of the internet is that there is so much that you can find, but also that is the downfall, right? That you like, because there's so much information and you're, you get lost in the sea of it. And so the critical part of being able to find interesting things is making sure that you're not paying attention to the uninteresting things. And that sounds simple, but an example of this, like you guys mentioned, you subscribe to a couple newsletters. I know people that subscribe to 10, 20, I, I once asked people this question and they looked and they just, there's a like setting in Substack where you can see how many newsletters you subscribe to. And they had 80 newsletters that they subscribe to. And I'm like, how are you ever going to find the best stuff if your mind is just completely overloaded with yes, the shit yeah. that's online? And so the first thing I would encourage people to do is make sure that they're only subscribed to a few newsletters that are amazing. Some of the ones that I subscribe to, for example, Exponential View is an amazing one. Numlock mm -hmm. is another amazing one. Charter is another amazing one. So yes. make sure that you're only getting the best stuff. That's that's the same thing for, like, for example, Twitter. I have a rule where on Twitter, I only follow 99 people. Now, that's not to mm -hmm. sound like this, like, you know, this person who's so cool and only follows this number of people, but because I used to follow more people and I realized that I was basically giving my attention up to this algorithm that, like, is going to surface whatever the hell it wants. And so now yeah. if I go to follow someone, I have to unfollow someone. And mm -hmm. I have to like think about that. It's like, who is truly driving value? Who's sharing things that I've never seen before? Yeah. And, and I make that decision. And then I the saw other you thing- following my brother, just so you know, I saw you unfollow <laughs> him. You, did, you, you made the right choice, Steph, just saying. <laughs> Steph, it's okay, after today, it's, I'll, I'll earn it back. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if that's true, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm messing around. You just, just threw her under the bus, man. Why are you doing? You don't do that to the guest. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Steph. Keep, keep going. No, with you're good. That was, that was a great joke. I So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then another thing is, like, I mean, we go down the rabbit hole of like tools that do this. But in, as an example, the other amazing thing about the state of the internet today is you have sites that aggregate the stuff that people find the most interesting. Here's what I mean by this. In the past, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you got whatever happened, you happened to find on the internet, whatever your friend sent you. Today, you can go on a site like subreddit stats. You can look at all of the top subreddits that exist on that site. And then within the subreddits, you can look at all of the top upvoted posts on a particular subreddit in a given time period, the last day, the last week, all time. Oh, yeah. So instead of you having to sift through all of, again, the junk that exists online, you have sites that allow you to do this to, to basically see what is truly the most interesting. And so, again, I, I probably could create a course that maybe would be slightly more interesting than what I'm saying now, but it's all about, as people say, crafting your information diet and using some of these tools like subreddit stats that basically do the work for you, right? Where you don't have to go guess what people find interesting. You yeah. can just find out for yourself. I mean, another example of like these little hacks, like you can, uh, if you guys know how to use like Twitter advanced search. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know that, but you can, for example, go to someone mm -hmm. that you find interesting, their profile. You can go and, and search like, uh, like Steph Smith IO, min likes 10,000 or something. And then you can see all of their tweets that have gotten over 10,000 likes in all of history. You can do that for 50,000, you can do it for less, right? Um, and wow. that can show you, you know, what has resonated with people and doesn't mean go copy their work. Certainly if you end up using it, credit them. But there's yep. also an element to, I think what we've gotten really good at, at trends uh, is understanding what people find interesting. And so just by going through that exercise, go through your like 10 favorite Twitter follows um, and then do that exercise and just see like, what people like in terms of what they're creating and that'll give you a sense of what people find interesting yeah absolutely do, do you have like a a time that you dedicate every day for for research time blocks or or no you're like as you go you start pulling notes and putting them in your evernote and all that so there's <laughs> a, a little bit of both so i have like for a lot of my emails i like remind myself instead of reading them at the time, I have a block on Sunday where I just like go through all of the like newsletters that I go through. Um, but there is just an element of a lot of people surf the web and then 
don't like take bits and pieces of what they're finding and put them in an Evernote or a Notion. Um, and then they just forget everything, right? Because their brains aren't built to retain that much yeah. information. Um, but yeah. there's also interesting tools. Like another tool that I encourage people to use is Keywords Everywhere, not mm -hmm. affiliated with any of these tools. But the amazing part of that is it's native to the browser. And so when you search something like one time I searched hard kombucha and I was just looking for hard kombucha because it's popular here in San Diego, but hard, um, keywords everywhere has the, the search volume for each of these things, but also how that's trended over time. And that just pops up natively as you're searching, which is really neat because you get this information real time where I'm like, I wasn't even thinking that this was an interesting search, but as soon yeah. as I searched it and I saw that graph, I was like, oh, well, this is actually something that maybe is is growing and maybe not as um not as common as i thought and then yeah i searched it in google trends and it's true it's just it's mostly in california and not in many other places that's wow. so awesome uh th this is this is what the course is by the way ready <laughs> it's a five minute the five minute video of like what we just said super simple right and then the resources like step one step two step three <laughs> yeah. that's it that's it <laughs> I love it. I love. It. By the way, thank you so much for simplifying this, right? Like, for yeah. example, uh, I, I honestly had in my mind that it was like this big monster of an activity that you would do <laughs> that you would like, you know, did like half an hour of yoga before diving into the activity <laughs> just to make sure, you know, you can focus on it. But yeah. yeah, thank you so much for putting it in this way. Is honestly, it's pretty empowering. It's like I feel. I personally feel like I do decent research on stuff and i i'm actually trying to build like my own settle casting and all that stuff you know we can talk about all that another day <laughs> but um i geek out around those stuff but at the same time i'm like man am i doing it the right like i don't feel like i'm finding stuff that is and, and maybe i'm just in my mind you know tell myself like i'm not finding enough or that good of stuff and i'm actually are finding good stuff but just hearing your process is kind of like empowering like okay okay i'm on the i'm on the right path uh, you, you, know? you have information FOMO because you find information and then you're like, <laughs> how many more hours should I stay here and try to find something Re else? Reading so, about this stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. You just saved us many hours. <laughs> uh, well, you know what's funny about that is just many people, Trung, who also works at The Hustle, is like incredible at surfacing all types of stuff. And people have asked him the same thing. They're like, Trung, can you please do a research course? And he hasn't said this explicitly, but um, he's basically said like, you guys, I just spend a ridiculous amount of time online. Like, I just, I just spend way too much of my time on my computer. And I would say the same thing about myself. Like, I spend a lot of time online, so it's only natural that exactly. I'm gonna find some cool stuff if I spend most of my day online. And so, okay. I wouldn't encourage other people to to do the same. But um, what I would encourage people to do is like craft that information diet. Yeah. La okay, sorry. Last question about this. I promise. I promise. I won't bother more <laughs> about, about, about the research side of things. But I'm I'm curious. Okay, you said that he spends a ridiculous amount of time online. Does he spend a ridiculously amount of time online with a purpose? Like I am doing research for X topic, or he's just literally online and then just pulling a bunch of stuff. That's a great question. So I can't necessarily speak for Trung, but I do know that I think most of his time is actually with a purpose. And that's actually a great point is that mm -hmm. I know tons of other people who spend, you know, 12 hours a day online that don't find interesting things, but he writes for the hustle. He also has a podcast of his own. And so he's out there creating things. And by the nature of creating things, I think you actually, you orient yourself to go down better rabbit holes because they're like meaningful rabbit holes. You'll be writing about like Trung, for example, recently wrote about um, like Warren Buffett's incredible investment in Apple. And so just having an orientation, when he starts going down those paths, he ends up finding yeah. all types of other stuff, but at least mm. he's, he's got like a map um, versus yeah. I, I think to your point, you can get, you can be very unproductive if you have absolutely no map of what you're actually trying to find. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I think, and you know, going back to to the beginning of of the interview too, or the conversation is, uh, you know, simplify, start doing. It. Make the decision. I'm gonna start doing this, and as you continue to put the reps in, whether that's publishing or doing the research, you're gonna find frameworks on how you individually work and then you can build your own system to collect either this research and then to like express it out to the world so i think that's also 
for us has been massively yeah. like every episode we debrief and we're like almost, almost every episode now we debrief and we're like what can change can, what can move this process forward and so on so i think as you execute the research you're going to be finding these tools these uh these sites that your own mind you're going to understand how you work and how you can turn that into into this content now Steph, last question of the show uh that the train wow. is calling your name again we, we, yeah uh, i was gonna say it. <laughs> it's back we got the horn <laughs> we got the train three times in the show look uh, at that the train yeah, wants you guys to are lucky me. normally it's only once but <laughs> steph you have to send us a picture of the train so like <laughs> that will be the cover for the thumbnail of the yeah. episode uh is this prof if you're train steph, steph and, and the train and the train i was gonna uh, say yeah. we had two guests today steph and the train <laughs> Absolutely, a two v two over here. Um, all right, Steph, where where will you be if you did not publish? Where would I be, as in like professionally or? Yeah, I, could, I mean, take, <laughs> both. If you want to share, yeah, I could say you can take it however you want. Um. So yeah, if I wasn't focused on content, I was actually thinking about this recently because I never thought I would be what people might consider a content creator. Like that was never my goal, as I mentioned. I stumbled into it because I had something to say. And so it, emotionally, I think I would actually like struggle to stop posting because I've gotten so used to being able to express myself in this way. It's almost like an outlet for me to share the things that I find uniquely interesting and like engage with people in that way. Um, but I think professionally, if I wasn't working in like marketing per se, I do actually want to move back to science at some point exactly what aspect of science i'm not sure i mean there's a ton of work obviously on climate change but um i miss aspects of like the mm. like scientific approach and experimentation and you get a lot of that in marketing um but i also miss i, I guess one aspect of marketing that i think isn't fully true but speaks to me is that like marketing you're often not discovering anything new right like it, it, you're using existing processes and maybe like yeah. Playing around with them um, or maneuvering in a way that someone hasn't before. But the thing that I find fascinating about like more of the hard sciences is that you're really like you're you're like on the frontier uh, of discovering new things. And so I, I do miss elements of that. Um, but I also like I said, I think there are a lot more parallels between marketing and something like biology or chemistry than people cool. think. Um, so, yeah, if I if I wasn't podcasting or tweeting, I would probably be doing that. Yeah, that's so cool. interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing. B very unique. I, I think we've mm -hmm. heard one like that before. I we love this question. Uh, so, Steph, where can people connect with you? Where can people, you know, see your content, your blog, your everything? And I was going to put all the links right below, but for those listening. Yeah, so my site is stephsmith.io. So that has all of the links. The most prominent ones are Twitter. I'm on Twitter at stephsmith.io because of my site. And then my podcast is the shit you don't learn in school. You can also find it at listenandlearn.co. Um, and then my book, which we mentioned, is Doing Content Right. You can find it at doingcontentright.com. And yeah, I think that's it. All right. Yes. We're going to put all those links at the bottom, so make sure you scroll down, tap them all, open all the links, buy everything, uh, so sign up support, on everything, follow. support. Yes. So I think today... <laughs> I'm going to have to remove one of the newsletters that I follow <laughs> and I'm going to add you to my, to my five newsletters spot, yeah. that, I, that I read on a consistent basis. Do, yeah. do, you, I mean, I first thing ask, do you have a newsletter that you send? I was going to say, I haven't sent it for a very long time. I'm talking like <laughs> over a year. So I'll let you know when it relaunches, if it ever does. I, but, I, uh, but next time we're going to have to do this again and bring some beers and yes. hopefully by then I'll have a new newsletter. Let's yes, go. That Part two. Amazing. Contents profit is always your your home. So yes, we're gonna we're gonna do that. Uh, Steph, anything else you want to add before we head out? No, just hopefully next time the train won't be so noisy. <laughs> it's all good. That it's was a, so good. Next time we'll include the train, you know, and we'll do like a whole hook with the train. <laughs> yeah. we'll, the train we'll needs a out. formal invite next time. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll do that and add the train. Uh, but yep. anything else you want to add? No, thank you so much for coming, Steph. This was absolutely amazing. And I can't wait to share the, the surprise yeah, that's coming. It's coming. <laughs> All right, with that said, guys, thank you so much for tuning into the Contest Profit Podcast. Go ahead and follow the show and uh, our social media app is Brosco. I got it. That I is got right. It. And if Steph, today help you move <laughs> one step closer towards your goal, please don't forget to share this episode and follow and 
and leave a five star review. See ya. Bye, guys. Sweet. All, All right. right. Steph, we're still live. We have a small, quick tradition. We got to take a selfie. Yeah. Selfie. The, selfie. Okay. The, the video got way better throughout, throughout the interview. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The audio is still good, but the, the video yeah, improved a lot. All right. Ready? Big smiles. One, two, three. Sweet. All right. Social media. We'll see you on Wednesday or tomorrow. Maybe we'll see. We yeah. have another member right. of the HubSpot family.